Welcome to Monarchist Minute, Royalist News out of the good old U.S. of A. I am William Stout. I am your host. I am joined here with Vice Chancellor Clements Magnolia and hey. a few new guests. Gentlemen, would you like to introduce yourselves? Let's start with the furthest on the um, left and work our way right. All right. Oh, wait. So, so that'd be water okay. feet first or okay. fireball. Okay. Uh, I I'm Declan. Uh, I've only been involved with MOA for a uh, couple of months, like maybe a month now. I've always had an interest in monarchism, perennially, especially via the Roman Empire and Roman monarchy. I, I don't know what to how to introduce myself, what my background is. I've been experienced with uh, politics for about. I've been active in politics since around 2016. I'm not sure what else to add. Out as much as you want, or as little as you want. It's up to what you're comfortable with, my friend. Uh, yeah, no, that's about it. All right, Frederick, you're up. Okay, my name is uh, Frederick, and I'm a semi-constitutional monarchist. My uh, beginnings in monarchism began with a certain YouTuber, which um, I'm not sure if I'm allowed to mention his name. Oh, go ahead. But, um, but he inspired me to become a monarchist, because before I was like a avid Republican... I, you know, was I mean, conservative, that kind of stuff, so. But, I'm genuinely yeah. curious of who the YouTuber is now. But, you know. And then, like, I got, and then that YouTuber uh, introduced me to, like, a lot of facts about the Hohenzollerns, so I believe now that we need the Hohenzollerns as the monarch of America, so... There might be some that don't believe me, but, you know, there was a Prussian scheme a long time ago to try to bring the Hohenzollerns into America to become a monarch, so, you know. We have discussed the Prussian scheme at length on social media and in past episodes yeah. of the podcast. It's yeah. one of those interesting tidbits that gets forgotten in American history, truly. Yeah. And, yeah, uh, and, um, yeah. I'm pretty sure that's it. All so, right. Yeah. Our last guest for the evening is Old Man Mammoth. Mr. Mammoth, how are you? Mammoth? Mammoth? Right. Mammoth? I'm alive. Yes. What uh, you, I saying? You're supposed what? to introduce yourself. I am introducing myself. That's what I've been doing. You just haven't been listening. With your mind's okay. eye. Okay, okay, just introduce yourself, man. I am who I've always been. Oh, man. Very deep, very deep. Mm. I yeah. hope not. I'm an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> That's the best introduction we've ever had on this podcast. Uh, yeah. It's probably one of the more honest ones we've ever had on the podcast. I, I know why I'm here. I'm here for brownie points. <laughs> brownie points. And the actual brownies afterwards. Mm, brownies. Yes, unlike Charles, there will actually brownies. be sweets afterwards. Yes. <laughs> yes. <Yeah>. So, <laughs> okay. So, I, now that we have introduced ourselves, let's... So, what are we talking about here, uh, Strout? Well, um... First, I wanted to go over some changes to the podcast, as some of you may have heard through rumors and through our social media. We've had some changes in leadership, and mm -hmm. it seems that for the time being, I'll be the one in charge of the podcast for the foreseeable future. So I implemented some changes and reforms, the primary one being that for those of you who want to join us live, it is no longer on Friday night at 8 p.m., but Saturday night at 8 p.m., and the main reason right. this is is because I thought it would make it more accessible to more people. And therefore easier for those of us who want to be on the podcast to join us and enjoy. Because in the past we've had a lot of different conflicts and such with scheduling. Yeah, like, I have stuff, like, to do on Friday. So I have to, like, carry my phone around just to listen to the podcast. So that was a very um good decision. But I'm also thinking maybe we should bring the podcast to Spotify, maybe. That would be a good idea. Are, 
these are all things we can plan on and work on in the future, yeah. but there will be definitely more developments that will come with Monarch as, minute, as time goes on. And mm -hmm. I'm hoping to really grow the platform and make it something unique and better than what it was previously. Yeah. Not to say that the old format was bad. Right. Hmm. Oh, I guess this didn't take as long as I thought it was going to. So yeah, we got the let's talk about fast. the current events of things. Uh, the the you know the current conflict in uh, the Middle East, which is the Israel Hamas conflict. As much as this conflict is disheartening, violent, and destructive, given the history between Hamas, Palestinians, and the Israelis. Yeah, I think the, there is... There it's are, very there hard to not look at this and just say it's same shit, different day. Yeah, there were plenty of attempts to try to establish the Palestinian state multiple times, but the Palestinians just, you know... Like, it all just, um fell apart at the Oslo Accords, like, that's, yeah. that's like, the second Oslo Accords, it was, it was just over there. Like, mm -hmm. and I mean, there's not really much that you, like... When it comes to the modern conflict, really, when you look at it, it's so complex and goes so far back in history, going back it, in like, my honest, before Zionism. In, in my honest opinion, I think the Holy Land should be just like neutral ground, you know, between oh. the Christians, the Jews, and Muslims, instead of it being its own thing. If, if I remember huge. correctly... Jerusalem specifically was supposed to be an international zone, but that in fell the cool. yes in the orig in the original plan, which was the um when the British <laughs> left Palestine, the original plan was of course the two states, and then Jerusalem itself would be an international zone administered by I don't know if it was be administered by the UN, but something along those lines. You know, can I think you were talking about the League of Nations? Can we no, no, find no, 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 it was the, the UN, because this was yeah, post-World War, post -World War oh, II. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Can but we, they can have, we they find a map of... Palestine, so. Yeah, they can we the... find a um, map of that original state layout real quick? Um, I just remember, the, like, with that map, I, I'll need to have to look it up to get an image of it, but that the Gaza Strip and uh, the West Bank weren't connected by any land route, except a very thin one, which I think that was yeah. just spelling for conflict, of, like, initially. And the area's too like geographically important for it to be neutral this is just if it wasn't like the israelis and uh, the palestinians it'd be two other powers in that same region fighting over it and, like uh, you can easily switch out any of the factions because it's like the geographic reality of the region that that area is going to be a hotbed for conflict because it's so strategically and geographically appointment uh important and plus religiously because you know it's the holy land for both, uh, for all three, for all three, um, Abrahamic the faiths. Great three. You know, I've heard this discussed for a long time, and of course, I have the solution. It's very simple. Neither side gets Israel. The entire land shall go to the Kurds. Like that's honestly <laughs> the only realistic Kurds. solution. Is you have it's to put solution the Kurdish to the um ongoing Kurdish issue in Turkey. It's certainly exactly. a solution. New you can, I, I can hear the Turks in the I can hear the Turks in the background already chomping at the bed. Perfect. <laughs> I know, I know. I've solved world peace. You can take me I later. Mean, you, you I know, know I can hardly say that's you know, there now that I just the want Jews to talk don't have a home. Oh, sorry. You know, just looking at this map, all I gotta say is I've seen worse border gore. I've seen I mean I've seen better border gore in a um paradox game. <laughs> oh, you should map. you should take a look at uh yeah we just posted uh, the 1947 plan uh, like a lot of these problems just stem back to European like intervention in the Middle East and Africa a lot of the conflicts are just in that region like the Sykes Picot like, Greenland has yeah. been a disaster it, it, yeah. all the words out of my mouth I was getting ready to say the Sykes Picot Agreement has been a disaster for mankind I mean I <laughs> do I, I do agree I think um. I, mm -hmm. I do think that the entirety of Arabia itself has always been a very chaotic region due to the fact that it's mostly a desert and very nomadic, specifically around yeah, these Saudi Arabia and the desert areas. But still a Hashemite-united um, 
Arabian monarchy probably would have been a much better solution to the issue than what we currently have. I think what might have been the better solution was that to create the Hashemite area and independent Kurdistan and maybe in, even an Assyrian um, republic yeah. or something along those lines like in the region yeah, to try and counterbalance anything. Somehow, and then I, I, do, I do think um, probably uh, it, in Pal the Palestine area would have should have been like a you or a, yeah, a mandate, maybe, an international mandate still. Uh, yeah, maybe somehow. West Bank. Right, <laughs> West Bank should be the um, the official state of Palestine at that point because you know the rest goes to Israel. Well, including it sort, it sort of was Gaza. for a while. I mean, the problem with the Palestinian issue was the fact that it was actually the West Bank was administered by the Kingdom of Jordan for quite a while. Yeah. Well, just let the Jordanians annex it. They don't want well, it. That, well, that yeah, was they the don't problem. Want it. They, 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 had it. It. they had it for a while, but then the uh, then um the Six Day War kicked off, in which the Israelis completely destroyed the entire Egyptian air force. And when the Jordanians asked the Egyptians what had happened, because they saw a large air force on their radar, the Egyptians were like, "Oh, oh yeah, we just that's our air force. We just crushed the entire Israeli air force. Hey, you should join the war." And so they did, to which they were then you know, quickly crushed by the And then they were quickly destroyed by the yeah. You know, and speaking of Egypt, Jordan, and Lebanon, I gotta say, I think it's very really <laughs> hypocritical of all of these nations who claim to support Palestine just saying that the refugees can just stay there and get bombed. Okay, well, well, well George the thing, they tried that before. has been a... Oh, yeah, sorry, go on. Yeah, they tried that before. Lebanon took in Palestinian refugees right after Lebanese civil war between the Falangists, like the PLO, Hamas, all those groups immediately all started killing each other for political power. Um, so, and Jordan did it too. They immediately had like issues with terrorism and a refugee crisis that they couldn't handle. Same thing happened in Egypt. Like all these Okay, so what I'm getting from this is that the Palestinian Arabs just seem to be bad juju. No, no, yeah. no, no, that's not, no, listen, all right? I've been hearing what you've all had to say, and I have a new solution that will definitely work in the modern age, all right? The right. United States invades Saudi Arabia. We oh. overthrow the government. <laughs> we sell the land to the Palestinians. There you go. Uh, yeah, because like no, but there's <laughs> one, there's great. one. Okay, there's one great problem with that. There's one problem that with that. A great point. Oil. I wonder how we're gonna do that. What the wait, problem? No, Saudis have brilliant. so much money they could just hire. Okay, what's the problem? Problem is oil. Well, here's no. the thing. I mean, we can still if keep the oil. If we, <laughs> this is all right. If we invade, we take the oil. So no, that. no, we don't need to do that. <laughs> and, it will end, and, listen, and it will end the Iranian Saudi Arabian Cold War. Peace honestly, in the honestly, I'm very <laughs> down for this plan, unironically, uh, because I have a real hate relationship oh, you, you with the have, you, you shouldn't be down with any of my ideas. I'm an idiot. No, M Mammoth, you actually I, are onto something here because I, here's the other thing. The Saudi Arabian oil, we don't even need to take control of that. That's only for Europe. We don't have to act, like, if we want to just break with Europe because Europe's going to break with us at some point geopolitically. Yeah. Like, we can just destroy the House of Saud and like shoot them in the foot on the way out. I, and then we, I, can I, just, no, wait, and then we just keep the oil and sell all the oil to Europe to pay off American debt. I don't, I don't, I think that that's but, oversimplifying things a bit. Uh, the, I think I'm pretty sure the problem. issue. With, the oil is more just the the amount of oil on the market affects prices around the globe. Yeah. Uh, also, like we shouldn't let Europe break with us politically. Uh, just, I, I'm just gonna throw that out there. Listen, well, all right? If they Europe's tried to only do that, divided among itself. Listen, if they tried to do that, it, it then all... we invade Ireland. Oh, well, why yeah. Ireland? Why it's a, it's Ireland? It's an do you think Ireland will stop us? They'll embrace it. They'll be the fifty-first state. No, that'd be Sicily. Sicily wanted to be the 51st state. Oh, Let's uh, actually take them. That, that is no, I think, uh, oh, no, I think that's uh, Puerto Rico. Rico. All right, no, no, gentlemen, after, gentlemen, uh, gentlemen, one, yes. one person at a time, please. Uh, okay. so, but uh, Fireball is correct. After World War II, uh, when we were in Sicily, there was a great call for Sicily, the island of Sicily, to join the United States. <laughs> I mean, I'd rather... If you like. I rather Sicily than Ireland because the food's a lot better. But listen, all right, there's a great amount of Irish population here in America. 
Our president is currently of Irish descent, so clearly we shall invade Ireland. And send him back to Ireland. That's a good idea. No, 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 no. We need him at the moment. <laughs> That's we need him at the moment. But Definitely we'll send him to Kennedy. They, they, they could keep the Kennedy. And uh, we keep the beer. Wait, 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 wait. I Kennedy's like the Kennedy. Beer. Beer. The Kennedy is most of our dad. Exactly. I'm a big I, Biden. I do George. like keeping the beer, though. Guinness is my um guilty pleasure. It's like sending them to a farm upstate. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> the Kennedys. <laughs> but um, maybe we could insp uh, invade Portugal at that point. Uh, no, but here's right? the thing. In Ireland, in Ireland, they speak English. <laughs> Who speaks Portuguese? Yeah, okay, here's Brazil. Also the Brazilian. Brazil. What is this? Brazil? China already has its foot in the door with Portugal as well. Yeah, okay, okay wait a minute. Brazil is a bad example. Who speaks Portuguese to Brazilians? Hey. Look how bad they are. In Angola. Like they figured out their civil war. They Those speak it in Angola? Angola. Angola. Yeah, yes, they, they do. do. Yeah. yeah, the oh. Portuguese made sure that they colonized them very well. Yeah. It's... Maybe we should stay a bit more uh, uh, on, on topic. On topic. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, technically, yeah. every topic is on topic if you think about it hard enough. Yeah, I think we, we're, di we're going away from the main topic, and that's the uh, Israeli-Hamas conflict. Well, here's so, the thing. Why do you think that is? Can, because can we also be a bit more serious? Like, yeah, right. No uh, more funny uh, acts, guys. Like, here's the thing. What more can you add on talking about the conflict other than okay, war crimes occurred. This is sad. This is tragedy. What do we do? And then the debate about intervention or not, which is going to be something that's already coming up by a lot. I, really okay, I, okay, I know. I know. I know. I'm. I'm just quoting off Michael Knowles here. But the goal, are the United States's goal here, is to contain. The war so it does not spread. That is the last thing we want. Our goal should be to contain this war and make sure it does not spread anywhere else. We don't want any other Arab nations getting involved in this. We don't want the Iranians getting involved in this. I mean, it sounds like Iran is already Iran getting, involved. getting involved in this. Like, Iran's been directly They're like, already involved. involved but, like, they gave money to the freaking um, Hamas terrorists. Well, Hamas has always been an Iranian front. Like that's been Hamas's yeah, purpose is to antagonize Israel whenever it can. Like, in the, we expect Iran to back them there. We don't want them being more direct about their support. We don't want them to be sending over actual equipment, other than, like money. Well, actually, even sending equipment like that's expected. we don't want them directly joining the war. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I heard, exactly. I heard that they're very close to getting a nuke at this point. I so believe they way. have a nuke. What they're doing is testing the ballistic missiles right now. They, they so could. they have the bomb itself. They just don't have the delivery system. Probably figuring that out at this point. But if oh. but nukes are a completely different thing when it comes to foreign mm. policy. Because and you know that actually leads us into our next topic: nuclear weapons. Yes. For those of you who don't know, and, well, real quick, Frederick, sorry for cutting you off. Go ahead and finish your thought. Yeah, so I'm surprised that at this point we haven't invade, invaded Iran. <laughs> that'd, be, that'd be interesting if we, we tried were to, to by proxy with the Iran-Iraq war. Like, here's the issue is that Iran is a mountainous <clears throat> region. It'd be like Afghanistan on steroids with an actually mm -hmm. functional government compared to oh, Afghanistan with like... the tribes. I think well, it'd be like Vietnam Desert Edition. At that's that point. basically Afghanistan. <laughs> and they're they're, like... they're a little too closely tied to Russia for that to work. I think, right? Like, um, oh yeah. So. If we had no worry I, of the Russian intervention, like either way, we wouldn't do it. I don't think, this... given the current state of the Ukrainian conflict, I don't think Russia is in any state to intervene in any more conflict at this point in time. Yeah, like, um, I actually saw some posts on uh, Twitter a while back about how people are thinking the Ukrainian-Russian war will end the same way the Iran-Iraq war did, because it is a fairly similar with, like, how the regional powers fought it out, with yeah. it being a stalemate. Honestly, the f I just gotta okay. say, if we're gonna go off on a quick tangent about the Russian war, I find the in Russia's entire performance in the war incredibly underwhelming, if not pathetic. 
Yeah, it it's pretty horrible from the the eyes of us. And we, we all thought that the Russians were, you know, unstoppable. But this war has proved to be just a show off of power of I mean, on their side. It's from some so. Red Dawn, the modern warfare, there are a million and one instances in pop culture, especially in the West, of Russia being this powerful, ethereal force we must fear, and they can't even take out a country a, a fraction their size, literally right next door. The thing that's yeah, like... Like, at this but, point, we should just dissolve NATO, because there's <laughs> just no reason to have NATO if Russia is just no threat at that point. Yeah. Like, the purpose of NATO right now is just to be a place of both European and uh, American influence, but, like, as I was talking about earlier, yeah. with splitting with Europe, like, Europe's geopolitics seems to be m moving more towards Russia and also China compared to the U.S., and also they keep on messing up yeah, our belt, politics belt in road. the Middle East and Africa. Yeah, the Belt Road Initiative is is kind of successful at this point. Yeah, like, I've kind of accepted the fact that, like, China is a world power, we should just work with them and live with them to the best of our ability compared to just trying to change them, because yeah. an external change would but, not come to China. But we're beginning to lose our, um, you know, our, um, and status more? as a world power at this oh, yeah. point, because we can't, we can't be helping our civilians at home and abroad anymore, because we're having problems at home. So there has to be like an exit way out of being the policeman of the world kind of thing. Like I'm thinking uh, we could encourage the Europeans to build up their own army and then dissolve no. NATO. Yeah. No. Uh, what are you a we don't, we don't want to in encourage the decline of our international influence. That's the thing though. I mean, we undermine our influence, they, they are dependent. They are dependent on us for defense. And, you know... I mean, personally, with the exception of East Asia, because I feel like we need to still treat Japan, Philippines, and the East China Sea as our sphere of influence, I would yes. be okay with the U.S. just becoming an American power again and just locking down everything in the new world and nah. letting the old world focus on old world problems. There. That's well, no, that because that's not how that that's not how it works. Yeah, the um, old world will focus on old world problems until somebody has the um, ability to focus on more than just old world problems, and then suddenly that's our problem. Yeah, no, that's what yeah. we need. Right. Nature right. abhors right. a vacuum. Either, so either, it's either better we that, stay, yeah, either we stay yeah. two steps ahead, yeah. or it becomes our problem. Yeah, yeah, either, I either mean, we I, hold I the mean, position yeah. or somebody else does, and right. I'd rather we do. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I, that is fair, like, given for, the historical precedent on how we got basically dragged into both world wars. Uh, if I may say. Yeah. Like, okay, like, can can we not do the voices? Right. Okay, let's continue, old man, what you were about to say. Thank you. The idea of America poking on itself, sure was an idea that existed in, well, a century ago. Doesn't really work in the world where everyone's connected at the push of a button. There is no just America focusing on America, because no matter what, we are connected to literally everyone else. That is very, very true. We're kind. Of, I guess you you are right in that aspect that we're kind of past the um point of no return when it comes to isolationism. Yeah, but we're you can't at the point. Wilsonian Bell. But you have to understand that you know we can't support ourselves anymore because if you take a look at our roads, it's it's a mess. our. You okay, know. well, okay, well, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. I'm sorry, but the Rhodes argument is quite frankly BS. Okay, I'm very sorry, but I have to call that out now. The Rhodes argument is down to the states. It is the state's duty to deal with their local infrastructure. If it if they are falling apart, that is due to the state's problem. 
and I mean local states like like North Carolina, well, Ohio, Virginia, I mean, those states, yeah. and like uh, like the high the interstates. Yes, that is technically federal stuff, yeah. but the majority of infrastructure in the U.S. is down to the states, and people keep on, and that's a problem. People keep on acting as if the federal government needs to be the one to do this. And it's, it's a, not their duty to do everything. We have local governments for a reason, but people always forget the fact that most of the stuff that happens to you and most of the stuff that will influence you is the local governments. A lot of the, this points towards like the American fetishization of like the federal level of government above all. Like I don't, I don't even know who my House of Delegates is, and I'm ashamed to not know off the top of my head. But I know who my senator is. <laughs> Like, no one really focused on local politics, which is yeah, why local all politics yeah, is so decayed. Yeah, like, like, and the whole reason I'm even able to say that is because I am very active in my local politics. I have met my state representative. I have met my state senator. I I meet the mayor. I see the mayor of my town every week because we go to the same church. But that's besides the point. I talk with them very often. I'm very active in my county's um, Republican Party because my county votes like 60% Republican. So, you know. Yeah. Yeah, like local politics is the foundation of it. Like, in the, if anything, just go to a local like city council meeting or something and just sit in. If anything, you'll just see very weird people going up to speak to the council, and that can be entertainment of itself. If not, you yeah. get involved in local politics, like, which is weird yeah. of its own. If there's a level of weirdness that you're gonna have to get used to. At least that's what I experienced when I helped like, a school board campaign. A lot of strange people. Yeah, I know how that is because there was one guy. Who somehow got elected as a member of our of our county's um, board of education, and the dude was an utter nut job to the fact that my my civics teacher would always show us the crazy stuff he's done. And one of my my friend, um, his father is friends with him, and he told me that he came over one time and completely blackout drunk. Right. Oh. So that's one of the things that people don't understand that local government is where a lot of stuff is at. Right. Like, Although I do think people are beginning to get more active in that with um, the um, education and such. Oh yeah, school board is a yeah. hot and, like, area that's a yeah, massive amount of conflict. I think I think ever since the election of um, Governor Yunkin in Virginia, it's become um, education has become a much larger issue. Yeah, because I think in a lot of states, like the percentage or the average performance of students is going low because. Uh, well, students are lazy, I guess you could say. Now, I'm not saying all of them are lazy, but some of I them because... Like, I feel like a lot of it goes in with the, the big mental health crisis that we have, and a lot of yeah. people are... um, A lot, especially young people, are giving up on their future because they don't think there's hope. It also comes yeah. from a level of alienation, that's like, too. Yeah, and that's like, uh, I believe, an institutional thing. Possibly. Because if if you know the education system, it's the same stuff from, like, the industrial age, I believe. Mm -hmm. You just go into a room, get into a desk, and you just copy what's on the board. And you have no thought about it. I mean, I forget. thought we should return more to the Greek school where... Education is more about rhetoric and understanding and yeah. Yeah. learning skills rather than um just set curriculum. Like we need to do more to teach kids critical thinking, how to think rather than yeah. You know, it's it's more better. Yeah, it'd be more better to do that, but I'm not sure if that's gonna happen because of the lobbying industry that is for a set curriculum. Because, because I believe Mr. Rockefeller or some other rich dude says, we don't want a nation of thinkers. We want a nation of workers. And so, that's the capitalist mindset that put us where we are right now. Yeah, yeah. And we have a dumbed out population that can't think for itself. Well, like, always... well Now, I'm not saying everybody doesn't think that way, but... I, I'm more going to uh, say, like, a lot of people's stupidity is also a lot easier to see now with social media. Like, foreign yeah. people didn't know anything, like, going back, even with, like, the start of modern education. And before that, with the more traditional sides of education, that was oftentimes either good education was kept to the upper classes or 
you barely, like you just knew what you could learn when you could. Like, yeah. People are dumb. The people have always been dumb. And I don't mean that to say that in like a nihilistic sense. It's just like everyone can be stupid and that stupidity is easier to show on social media. Yeah. Oh, you are clipping enabled. And, and a lot of people don't even know basic facts about our country. They want to say, oh, yeah, the, the U.S. is over here in Europe. And it's like, have you ever been in geography class? Guys, yeah. guys, who enabled clipping? What? I just, I just got a notification that someone has enabled clips. Clips? Um, I, I did not. Anything. I do not. Also, why did you ask that? Talk. Here, but okay. Okay, um, I'll edit this out about 30 minutes in. Mm. Mm. Oh, now it's gone. So you said something about my background is uh, fuzzing up? No, 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 it's not that. Don't, don't worry about it. Okay, so what we were talking about again? Um, like the decline of the education system, but also at modern alienation for the most part. Like it was, seemed to be a mixture of like the school systems and how that affects up people personally on personal intelligence. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, like I think the the modern school system derives from the Prussian system, because you know the the Prussians were doing the exact same thing that we're doing today during that time. That you know, came of Prussia was still a thing. Prussia was a big driving force in standardized education because it was part of their officer training for the military as well. Yeah, yeah, because, you know, they wanted soldiers, you know. Soldiers and they that... wanted, it wasn't just they wanted soldiers, they wanted well-informed NCOs as well and such. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah, we... and, and, and because of that, they have, they're accomplished with a bunch of sciences and stuff that mm -hmm. we appreciate today. Mm-hmm. And speaking of uh, accomplishments I... with science, especially with German scientists, do we want to move on to our next topic, or does anyone have any yes. final thoughts? Yes, nuclear weapons. Sounds good. All right. Yes, nuclear weapons. For those friend. of you who don't know... Russia threw out a nuclear testing treaty, and within hours, the U.S. was already testing bombs. Oh, no. I posted about this on yeah, Twitter, and the article should be in the news. Let me go grab it. Was it the yeah. SALT treaties? I forget which treaty. I it, no, I it wasn't it was the SALT, salt treaties, because those have to do with cobalt weapons, and those are uh, very, very different. Cobalt? Things. Yeah. I thought radio we put that stuff in electric cars. Well, if you put radio in a bomb, it has rules. an extremely long half-life, and you basically salt the earth. Yeah. But yeah, after near hours after Russia revoked an atomic weapons testing treaty, the U.S. is testing bombs underground. While I'm not a fan of nuclear proliferation... God, does that make me love my country that we were just ready to um do that as soon as we hit the ground running. I, I'm i just going to have to say it now. Nuclear weapons are not a very good idea if you have a leader that uh, can't even speak right. So There's like, someone who is like uh, a filter against like an... A nuclear attack by the president. There's a lot of like checks and balances around it, other than him just saying go. Like technically, I believe that the codes are kept on the Secretary of Defense, not actually with the president. And the Secretary of Defense has to bring them to the president. Yeah, because if it was the case that the president could just press a button, Nixon probably would have launched the nukes. And we would have like, all him. Said, yeah, yeah, we would have all been screwed. And I am, just remember, I'm not a crook. Uh, there's an interview I'd need to find of like Henry Kissinger talking about Nixon just like being mad in the corner and talking about like killing someone and trying I, to order it to yeah, happen. I and love, and you can walk away from him and wait for him to chill out. Yeah, I, I think love we're going off topic out. here. About oh, yeah, no, sorry about that. No, 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 but it's okay to get off topic a little bit on this because I do love hearing about all the stories about just how belligerent, angry Nixon was as a president and how much his. Staff loathed him as a result. 
You know about the hostage taking Nixon would do, right? Oh fuck. Where you would just like keep talking to someone like a staffer for hours and hours on end and like they couldn't leave because you know he was the president. I remember there being one story where yeah. he went to the restroom while in the meeting, kept the door open and kept screaming at his staff from the bathroom so the meeting could that was like Johnson. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that was Elvis. Oh, that was Johnson. Yeah, that was yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, like, yeah, nice. some other things about him. He had like a whole bunch of intimidation tactics, and that was one of them, which was hold a meeting while on the toilet. Which oh like uh, a lot of the Cold War presidents, which like are just kind of a lot more weirder than the modern day presidents. Like politicians really have evolved from that time, which I feel as if no modern politician they would like proliferate nukes, but like they wouldn't even get tempted to put in their policy to be ready to use nukes. Like ever since uh was the guy that ran against I believe LBJ for his second term? Uh, Barry Goldwater. Yeah, yeah Barry Goldwater yeah. with the uh, ad with the nuclear weapon. The girl singing, or like the girl on the field. The Daisy it. Girl. Yeah, that's the, the one. Daisy. Thank you so much. Yeah, the Daisy Girl. Daisy Girl. Do you think that kind of like, with the proliferation of nuclear weapons, gonna, at least testing, do you think that kind of uh, duck and cover fear mongering is going to return, or do you think we're past that as a society? I, I don't uh, know, but given how a lot of high schoolers don't take school shooters as seriously as a lot of people probably think they do, I honestly can more likely see us starting memeing about it, and it's going to become like a joke <laughs> or something. Oh, yeah. And for some time, it'll become a joke. Especially given that now, as a society, we've become saturated with things like Fallout, Metro Last Light, and the idea of a nuclear apocalypse is, um... Appealing to oh, some. Yeah. What was that? It's a, it's a cultural zeitgeist now, so... Yeah. It's gonna be uh, harder for people to take it seriously. Yeah. Oh, yeah, what was that ideology that says, okay... Let's end it all with nuclear weapons. Pasadism. Um, yeah, Pasadism. It's, it's com Pasadism. communist nuclear apocalypse. Okay. If you look at it in the context of its own philosophy, it makes sense. Outside of that context, it's actually insane. Uh, yeah. And with Pasadism, it have, to be, dolphins. You have to be mentally okay. insane to believe that ideology. No, no, not like that. It more is like, it's kind of like, you know, how people can fall into cults even though they're a normal person. Mm -hmm. It's that kind well, of level of it, where it makes enough logic in your brain that you could adopt it realistically, but it's not something mm -hmm. that, like, you could convince a normal person who's thinking soberly. Well, I do, to back up a little bit to nuclear proliferation, I do know one thing, and that is that the U.S. is planning to basically go all out. So, for those of you who don't know, most of our nuclear cores are manufactured in one laboratory in New Mexico, and that is the Los Alamos Laboratory. Yeah. Traditionally, during the Cold War, it made about three nuclear bomb cores a year. A few months ago, I read an article saying they're preparing to up that number to ten a year. They pulled the number of nuclear warheads that can be generated a year. Yeah, um, the, with the current uh, nuclear technology, these bombs are going to be more powerful than what were used during the uh, Cold War times, possibly. And more importantly, they're probably going to be a lot more compact, small, and easy to carry. Yeah, tactical nuclear weapons. So essentially, you could just bring them out in the field. And, Didn't they try that I with mean, the Davy Crockett? And it was if I remember correctly... <laughs> What's, we don't mention the Davy Crockett. We do not mention the Davy Crockett. Davy Crockett. <laughs> yes, yes, Davy Crockett. We do Davy not Crockett mention very... the atomic bazooka. Oh, it, it was an idea worth testing, like the uh, pentomic army. Like, I wonder, I'm really just concerned about the cultural effects of the reintroduction of nuclear production in the United States psyche, because there are a lot of people who rely off fear-mongering to basically grift off of people's fears. I wonder if that's going to yeah. make a huge, huge comeback with nukes. Like, maybe not duck and cover in schools, but there will be an underclass I, fear nuclear uh, when, like annihilation, the same way they fear Yellowstone blowing up. Now, yeah, when it, com right. when it comes oh, to nuclear geez. weapons, I think we should all, you know, decide whether we should have them or we should not, because...
Well, well, the problem, okay, the problem with that idea is the fact that when it comes to nuclear weapons, you have to remember MAD, the Mutually Assured Destruction Doctrine, which is, which is that if you have nukes, and you have another country that has nukes, if you go to war with that country, it is Mutually Destroy. Assured Destruction, you will all die. And that's the problem with nuclear bombs, is that if one country has a nuke... That's a nuke. That is a, that is a, the power of the sun that you can use against another country. Someone else is going to want that. So as long as there are nukes, there will ever other countries will try and get them so they can counteract you. Yeah, and the, this is the same money. way it happened at the end of World War Two when uh, the USSR looked at the U.S. when it used the the first two bombs on people in Japan. It also reminds me of that. Okay, there... that that could happen to us. So they were like, okay, we need to get a nuke and one fast. So, yeah, nuclear diplomacy is... Well, there has been a theory that has been floated, that I have seen floated by me, that has to um do with an explanation with all of the U.S.'s horrifically excessive military spending, is that we've spent these past... 40-some years since the Cold War ended, basically funneling money in the projects designed to basically obsolete the notion of mutually assured destruction. So some people are floating the belief that not only is the U.S. prepared to fight a nuclear war, but we have the capability to win it uncontested. Um, the I, problem with I, I don't that is... The problem I mean, with I'm that not saying is, it's true, but it's something I've heard. Everybody's dead. Yeah. Like I and said, besides I'm not saying that, it's true. I'm just. And besides that, you. and besides that, if you take a look at recruitment numbers, they're not very good, because we have a lot of people that can't even go through the. That is well, yeah. Plan. I mean, um, I think it was found that the uh, every branch of the U.S. military. Was not was meeting their um, quotas, excluding the Marine Corps. And, and plus, you have people waking up saying, "Okay, war is bad. I don't want to be a part of it. Don't join the army." And I'm hearing rumors that they will pass a bill that will introduce limited military conscription. They they Which... would never. That would kill like any presidential run. You'd have to be a candidate that does not plan on running again. Wait. And that kills army professionalism, too. We saw it in Rome, and we've seen it in, count in countless powers. Usually, when mandatory conscription is introduced, it is usually followed immediately by a decline in soldier quality. The other thing is, like, I want to get back to the uh, being prepared for mutually assured destruction. The only reason why that doesn't make sense for me is, like, how things like joint civil support and so on, which, and FEMA and such have like reacted to like practicing for nuclear attacks. They continually practice for them, and oftentimes their turnouts from their war games against a nuclear attack turns out to be not well on like how they would respond with civilian casualties. They probably don't care about civilian casualties because no, know. they're gonna care. They're, like even uh, if like, you're the uh, leader of like the country, you're gonna care. <clears throat> That's the whole point. If you're going to war with a nuclear power, then you're guaranteed you're going to have civilian casualties, which could be in the highest of numbers. The goal is always to minimize. Like, even if you you can accept civilian casualties, but as a nation state, as the leader of a nation state, it's in your best interest to try to keep as many people alive as possible, because if okay, the other guy doesn't do that, you can then finish off the war conventionally. Yeah. Or... We could just build nuclear bunkers, which that could be a very expensive, but... The U.S. It, has a it, lot of abandoned mines that might be suitable, if that were the case. It could be. It could be. But you'd, then you'd have to people. figure out evacuations and such like that. When people can't even follow hurricane evacuations, they're not going to follow a nuclear one when a nuke's going to hit in like seven minutes. Yeah, they're, they're probably going to just take out a gun and say, hey, we're going in before you guys. This and that. Unless you have the military there helping out. And honestly, depending on where I am, I might start walking toward the nuke because it'd be more merciful. Yeah. Like, 
Like really? if you're in New York City, you're not getting away from that. Make your peace with no. the law about that point. It's it's better to be in like the rural areas because who's gonna put a nuke in the 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 rural <clears throat> areas? It's gonna be like in the big cities, right? Where I'm, there's... I'm in a weird place where I'm not sure if I'm far enough away from Columbus, Ohio, to be <laughs> able to be out of range or not. <laughs> Yeah, so I know a place where I can go where it's out in the middle of where where, you know, it's likely that anyone will waste resources to launch a nuke there. But yeah. Mm. A lot of it, but yeah, it it's pretty scary what's happening nowadays. I wouldn't be too worried. Nation states, as irrational as they may seem, tend to act irrationally when it comes to conflict with each other. The first was the Ukrainian conflict. Now it's the the, uh, Israeli conflict. I'm sure next it's going to be somewhere it's in Asia. Taiwan. Most likely going to be Taiwan. Let's be real here. And yeah. Taiwan is probably not going to win or even hold out here. Uh, I think Taiwan. I don't think Taiwan. It all depends on. It depends long. on if um, mm-hmm. the Chinese are are of the same quality as the um, Russians. Well, uh, the issue yeah. with Taiwan is they built a surface fleet, and then focused on making like bunkers on the coast to defend against China. That's what the their military problem- spending was on instead of submarines. But the problem with the Chinese, even though they have the largest army in the world, they haven't been in a conflict for years. So their their command is inexperienced in combat. So and of course, yeah. What is building a force to invade Taiwan if they don't have the um fleet the power to get it to the island? Like, yeah, China has the largest fleet per um, ship capita. But if you look at tonnage, it's dinky. Nah. Yeah, I, yeah. I'm, I'd expect that uh, China would just try to blockade Taiwan and starve them out and interdict their trading. Like, it wouldn't be a actual but land war attempt. New just... black. Anyone who knows anything about the Cold War and the Berlin airlift, America will find a way. Well, no, yes, like, Taiwan maybe. would be self-sufficient food-wise, I'm pretty sure. I more mean, like, just to try to can... isolate them economically and diplomatically. Yeah, because they they have been preparing for how many years for an invasion of their home? If I remember correctly, not their home. they're not native I, to that place. If I remember correctly, Taiwan can mobilize 8 million people from their reserves at any one time. Meaning that Taiwan can yeah. basically triple the size of the Chinese standing army at the moment's notice. Yeah. If a lot of it, like, Taiwan is interesting to look at, especially from their current geopolitical perspective, because they willingly democratized from the dictatorship under the Kuomintang, which, like, yeah. won them favors with the West a lot, and I think it's one of the reasons why. The Kuomintang dictatorship is a pretty interesting one, because they chose to democratize. Yeah. I think part of what allowed them to democratize is the fact that Taiwan was became a very smaller but also isolated state from mainland China. It says it was smaller, had a more compact population. Not only did it um suffer more from Western influence, <laughs> suffer being probably a poor word, but it also makes democracy easier to implement because it's a lot easier to democratize a state with a few million people rather than a state with almost one and a half billion people. Yeah. I feel like that's always going to be the problem when it comes to China democratizing is that how do you create a um representative uh, democracy? I mean, I think like I that think that's, that's always been a problem in China though cuz China has always been a very much authoritarian <laughs> nation. The yeah. only time they ever came close to it was of course under the revolutions in Sun Yat-sen, but that revolution was a failure and I think China itself is just a whole lot different from a lot of other countries due to the fact that they were always a more bureaucratic nation. And I would and also China itself is a civilization. 
It's not really a nation, it's a civilization that's disguised itself as a nation. Because the Chinese have been going at it since... Like the uh, Bronze Age? Yeah, like even... Maybe maybe even before that, because there's also the possibility that they might have gone even before that. Yeah, like whenever the Qin Dynasty was, if you don't if you think it's a real dynasty and not a mythical one. It, oh, yeah. it's a real dynasty. We have the historical oh, evidence. No, I thought, Hold on, which I, one was I it? I know I have it like saved somewhere. We right only have the it. historical evidence of the second one. I could be wrong. Yeah, we yeah, have um, it's mythical. The Zhao Dynasty yeah, or something. The Xi the Xi Dynasty. Yeah. It's the Xi dynasty. The Xi dynasty is when we don't know if it's for sh true. The Shang did exist, followed by the Zhao, the Xin, the Han, the Jin, the Tang, the Song, the Yuan, the Ming, and the Qing. Okay. So it's the Xi dynasty. Yeah. Chinese history is always fascinating, but like I think the thing with China, modern day China, is it's a lot like oh, Russia, God. where a lot of the corruption is local, and then it gets less corrupt the more you go towards the top. There's still authoritarianism yeah. present, of course, but it gets less corrupt because that's how the yeah. system works. It's meant to weed people out so they don't accrue too much power. Yeah. Yeah. And bureaucracy. that's probably why China yeah, has the longest... And, and, that's pro and in my opinion, that's why I think China has perhaps the most functional authoritarian system of any modern country. Which is why it's been it lasted is. so long and it's so competent. Yeah, it, because it's self-correcting wow. like that. And oh, you can... Oh kind of understand why there's such an enduring civilization. Yeah. Hmm. That is very true. One of the now, strangest things about really it, funny thing about I think, I think because of China's population, this and that, there's no way they'll be able to successfully democratize. It, it's just no way they can. Unless, you know, they reduce their population to a where well, I don't. I think if democracy comes to China, it will be enforced on high. Yeah, it'll be an authoritarian. Be, it, really come as a, it would have democracy will arrive in China when it is forced down on high. Because as I don't remember who was the one who stated it, but it's the problem is the fact that corruption in China is much more localized. So you'd have to come down on high to destroy the corruption in the local level, which is, you know, one of the, which is why, back to the point that we were talking about earlier, local politics is important! This, I think, uh, I that, think um... this is, this is the, this is the lesson from this episode of Monarchist Minute, is local politics is more important than you understand. <laughs> yeah. And this is also why when MOA yeah, yeah. sat down and said when we eventually form a proper political party, we're not going to immediately shoot for national office. We're going to start yeah. building slowly in local governments and state governments and work our way up. Remember, in a lot of states, local elections are nonpartisan, so you can run without even being associated with a party. All you got to do is get the endorsements. No one's stopping you. Go and do it. It's and a lot of I think. I and think a lot, of time, a lot of our elections are superficial because only one person is running. Yeah. Yeah, I th I think if we were to have our own party, I think we should work our way through the local politics and then work the way to the top of the like, state. I feel like we'd have so to do that. Can... That's what we need to do to build um the support base that the other major parties have. That's yeah. the problem with third parties is they don't take the time to build up the support base they need. I could tell just a whole immediately bunch of head for the <laughs> national elections. Oh, it's not even just that. Here's the thing: when they do local elections, they underfund them. I was again involved with the Green Party for a bit, yeah, and every local single like, like local election was not looked into at all. Um, half the time they weren't they weren't allowed to take money from uh, small businesses. <laughs> They weren't allowed to do anything like that. The Libertarian Party doesn't have those restrictions, but other weird third parties do. And there's so many issues and so much drama inside these organizations that they tend to fall apart because of how they focus yeah. either on federal for the uh, headlines or they don't focus on local elections because they just assume everyone agrees with them and is going to vote for them if they show up on the ballot. Yeah. And they've struggled for ballot. Yeah, uh, yeah. Just, just, I think. I think. Um, let me just say something, Frederick. Um, I th I want to use the analogy of the oak and the reed for how like the politics stuffs work. Is that uh, there is an oak tree, and it says to the reed, "Ha! Look at me! I'm so much bigger and stronger than you, little reed. You simply flap in the wind while I stay here strong." And the reed replies, "Yes, but my roots run much deeper, so I can deal with the wind." 
and then there's a massive windstorm, and the oak tree falls over, and the reed still stands there flapping in the wind yeah. because its roots are much stronger than the oak tree. Yeah, that's yeah. beautiful. That's like a beautiful description because like, beautiful if you volunteer in your local community, build those connections, show up at your city council meetings, if you actually get yourself connected to the community, you are at, you're able to grow something. Yeah, it might another not one to what you idealize in your head, but you can grow something, and that's something that's beautiful. Yeah, and another example, if you know the the socialist party, they they completely broke off into different branches. Well, that's they, leftists. They fight among each well, other. The social, the, well, the American Socialist Party itself fell apart following the um. The First the, World War, know, due to yeah. due to multiple issues from the rise of the Soviet Union to Wilsonianism. Whoops. Got it. Yeah, they couldn't, they couldn't. Remember, really remember, kids. Wilson is the is the worst Virginian ever. He is the devil incarnate. Yes. Yes. He really yes. reintroduced racism to the point where we got an MLM oh. clan, multi-level oh. marketing pyramid oh, scheme no, clan. Do not even mention it. <laughs> Imagine yeah, resegregating the military. You know, that's the thing that just amazes me. Resegregating the, the bureaucratic system, too. They did resegregate the bureaucratic yeah. system. Like, how do you just resegregate the entire system? I mean, you have to remember that he was, that when he was the head of, I don't remember what college it was in the state of New Jersey, the college was nicknamed the most southern northern college in the Union. For how much he was pushing segregation in there. Oh god. This is why we didn't we do us. enough to glass the Confederacy after the Civil War. And we I blame push. that on Andrew Johnson for being a little I can't well, he, he he was, I well, he was he um, can't say it. himself. So. He can't say it. But we cannot but change as the a past proud unless... citizen. As a proud citizen of the state of Ohio, I live by the mantra that Grant and Sherman did nothing wrong. Right. I, I stand but by the... Uh, even like, if, living in the South, I don't stand by the Confederacy. I hate that. I hate how it's so even, culturally important in the South. Even if we could go back into the past to stop uh, Mr. Booth from killing Mr. Lincoln and preventing that whole Andrew situation, there would be just no point. And, well, you know, a lot of the whole like, thing because there will still be segregation no matter no, what. No, the early civil rights acts would actually be enforced. Maybe like the uh, separate but equal claw, like Supreme Court re ruling would not even be enforced by that, and because the president can ignore the Supreme Court when, like, by just not enforcing or enforcing certain laws. And I think segregation is something that Lincoln would probably do his best to set up the institutions, like Freedmen's Man's Bureau and such. To actually make sure segregation dies in the South, well, there I've could have been a destruction heard, of Southern identity. But I've also I've also heard an Even alternate there. take involving that, where some people would say that Lincoln's death is what galvanized the Union to enforce these anti-slavery and um, free yeah. and, uh, inclusionary policies because he basically it basically martyred him. Mm -hmm. Like, well, even yeah. outside of the martyrdom of Lincoln, like, the Reconstruction was going to happen either way because they seceded. They did treason. They did treason to the state of, like, the United States. Yeah, but... You can't trust them and let them have voting rights and come back in and just, you know, be normal. No, you have to punish them for that. Yeah. Like, hey, maybe you have to pay us all the money that you need from the slave <clears throat> Uh, no, nah, like reparations like that probably wouldn't have worked at the time. It would be a lot of uh, trying to institute a yeoman class probably among African Americans and getting them into a financial position of independence. That was the whole purpose of the Freedmen's Bureau was to sure up African American communities and get them educated because they didn't have access yeah. to those resources. One yeah. idea I thought of yeah, the whole reason was the whole yeah the whole goal was to create an African American middle class because the middle class is one of the most powerful things in the world. Like the whole reason, like again that's also one of the reasons why Ch early chinese democracy could not work there was no middle class you need to have a you need to have a middle class for a, for a democracy to be successful yes yes a educated well-informed middle class yeah because that if you can... don't what you have is the lower class which can easily be manipulated by the by the upper class 
And that's usually how democracies fail, is when the upper class is able to manipulate the lower class because the middle class either isn't there or doesn't act. It's also yeah. why like, Mao had to synthesize a whole new theory of Marxism to justify what he was doing in China. Because exactly, there yeah. was no proletariat, there was no petty bourgeois, there wasn't even a bourgeois. It was yeah. like old bureaucrats and peasants. That's it. Yeah. I, I was going to make a comment, but I forget what I was going to say. Oh, yeah. My, one of my ideas, if I was in charge of Reconstruction, was I would have found the plantation owners who were personally in line with the Confederacy, those personally in line with the government. Not all of them, just the ones that were involved with the Confederate state and the cause. And I would have confiscated their land and divided it up among the freed slaves. That way, isn't that what like Sherman wanted to do? I don't I know. Think that's what I think that's what Sherman did do at some points when he was marching through Georgia. I'm wondering, I'm wondering what the right Republicans were thinking during Reconstruction. I think they were thinking along those lines, and one of the things they wanted to do was they wanted to break up the southern states, and when I say that, I mean, like, literally break states and create new ones. Specifically, they wanted to create some majority African-American states as well, and I think that is a little bit dangerous, because what it would have done was really just galvanize the white populations of the South at the time, which is one of the reasons why I was kind of worried about, I, I am worried about the idea of the radical Republicans getting their way, is that they wanted to punish the South completely, and I don't know how well that would have gone over with the Southern populations, especially since we could have even seen a yeah, more, it, um, even uh, more radicalized um, uh, KKK, possibly. I, I think, that, like, that as an upstate that might have been advantageous, they, only they to would. give some representation to African Americans where it couldn't be uh, done behind polls. Like, maybe at least making one state out of the most heinous of states or areas that would make sense that like the people who live there are mostly african-american give them their own state so they can at least have political power in the senate and the house yeah then you have those who well, want well you to have to remember back. that at the time the state of south carolina i believe i believe the state of south carolina was a majority black state though but what happened is the fact that of course the white population was able to grab control of the um, legislatures and the writing districts and of course the jim crow laws and were able to garner control away from the african-american population and prevent them from voting because of course it all comes down to voter turnout yeah and also like factoring right. what we said earlier about um middle class being related to democracy like the south for the most part just had landowners some small petty bourgeois elements but not yeah. a lot and it wasn't able to establish a strong democracy in the south it was going to be yeah. for segregation until it economically developed and it actively sabotaged that development like the tulsa riots against the uh, yeah what was it called? The, 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 the Black Wall Street was what it was Black called. Black Wall Street, yeah. yeah. Yeah, Black yeah. Wall Street. And, that, and that's yeah, the that funny was... whole thing about, the funny thing about Confederate idealism is that it intrinsically stifled the development of the South. Yeah. 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 And here I'm gonna I'm gonna tie this back into monarchism because of course we are monarchists here. Yes. Again, it comes back to the fact of the monarch. Where does the monarch come into this? Well, the monarch themselves is of course the representative of the entire country. It is their duty to do what is best for the country. And although the monarch is an upper class person, I believe that the monarch should try and act in ways of supporting and listening to the middle class and what their problems are and how to improve their nation and improve the middle class and grow that middle class is that it will both greatly improve the, the status of their country and, and the abilities and, of it. Yeah. And, and also the, the, the poor class so they can become middle class. Middle class uh, exactly. And then, the, then people, people get more money. They become more um, economically yeah. stable and sound and they have better abilities. Now, all right. All right. Thank you all for joining us on Monarchist Minute. Yeah. Uh, do we ha does anyone have any final comments before we close in prayer? Get involved in local politics. Amen to and that. Read more books to, to understand topics more better. You know. pick, pick up the local newspaper. Learn something about what's going on in your city and get involved. It doesn't matter what it is. As long as you're getting out there and talking to people, you're going to help. For the, like spread the message you don't even yes. need to buy a physical and, newspaper a lot of newspapers have websites now and, and we also encourage you guys to spread the word as well so, so we're not the only ones that are spreading it so 
If you're if, not yeah. sure how, then feel free to reach out uh, to us uh, by email or by other means. And or on Twitter. Or on Twitter. The links will be in the description below. All right. All right. Y'all bow your heads and prepare to pray in the manner you are accustomed. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us of our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thy is the kingdom, power, and glory forever. Amen. Thank you all, and good night. How do you turn